Welcome. Thank you for joining us for Screenwriting Success Stories. Uh, we have with us Craig Borton from Dallas Buyers Club and Kelly Masterson from Snowpiercer. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Harold Greenberg Fund, who are the sponsors of this event. Thank you. So I'm English, and you tell me that this, this panel is called Screenwriting Success Stories. I immediately think of failure. Um, <laughs> I think every screenwriter knows that getting a screenplay made is itself a success. Uh, the percentage of scripts that make it that far is very small. Uh, in these two instances, uh, getting made was only the beginning. Dallas Buyers Club, written by Craig Borton and Melissa Wallach, directed by Jean-Marc Vallée, was a huge hit. I'm sure almost all of you have seen that movie. Uh, global box office was reported at $55 million against a budget of less than $5 million. Um, and of course, it went on to win Academy Awards for both lead actors, Matthew McConaughey and Jared Leto. And Craig was also an Academy Award nominee for his work on this movie in the original screenplay category. As for... <laughs> as for Snowpiercer, uh, that film took longer to reach North America. It, it actually premiered a year before a, at the Cannes Film Festival. But to give you a, a better idea of the scale of what a hit this film was, uh, across the world, the film has made $80 million. Uh, directed by... Yes, applaud the money. The money. So. <laughs> you haven't had the Academy Award success just yet, but... but I have to say, I loved the film, and it played in this theater for five consecutive Friday night late shows and sold out every one. So I'm a big fan of this movie. Thank you. Um, directed by Bong Joon-ho, starring Chris Evans and Tilda Swinton. It was distributed by the Weinstein Company, or picked up by the Weinsteins. Uh, and also is, is re reckoned to be one of the biggest hits to date on VOD, uh, where it came out almost immediately after the North American theatrical. Uh, I'd like to begin by offering a taste of the two films uh, for those who haven't seen them or a reminder for those who have. We have a couple of clips that our guests here have, have suggested. Um, we're going to start with Dallas Buyers Club and a scene uh, with Ron and Rayon in the hospital. Uh, it's the first time they meet and we're going to start uh, just as with the invitation to play cards. I don't know if there's something you'd like to say more to, to tee that up. Yeah, it, it, uh, this scene... We were trying to hit a couple different notes in this in this scene. Um, one, just to kind of show you the desperation that uh, you know, uh, AZT, which was still in trials, was not available to everyone, and it kind of speaks to you know, Ron's willing to buy it. Rayon is already selling it on the black market, and then on another level, it just we were trying to speak to his racism and, you know, Ron was this shit-kicking, drug-taking cowboy who had never seen anyone like Rayon. And so we just, you know, this character was developed because we wanted to put it in his face because uh, we felt if he, if a transgendered person looked the way Rayon looked, that Ron's character couldn't look away, you know, from himself, really. And so that's going on and, of course, we wanted him to, you know, Rayon to hit on him and uh, that reaction to that. And of course, the two ways that we wanted to, they're both outliers. And so they're the perfect outliers. And we wanted to show their commonality so you can understand that these two are great hustlers. And so we found that in money, right? So they're both after money. And once, you know, he asked him to be getting cash and Rayon does, we know it's on and we know that these guys, you can kind of buy that they would start this underground market. But the cooler thing about the scene is that Ron thinks he's hustling Rayon and actually Rayon wins and hustles Ron. So a little bit of that and uh, we decided no music and so it's very intimate and uh, it just came out great. I mean, I love the scene. So. Go ahead and roll that. And let's go straight to the Snowpiercer clip, too. Um, so this is a scene uh, 
featuring Tilda Swinton as, as Mason, the uh, villain of the piece, I guess you would say, or one a of them. The villain of the piece? Yeah, there's several. Um, so uh, this probably needs a little bit more setup, just in terms of the premise of the movie. Do you want to handle that? I, I can do it. The world is frozen. The only thing that exists in the world is one train circumnavigating the globe. And aboard the train are, in the back of the train are these guys, the poor, the impoverished, the oppressed, and one day they rise up against the people who run the train and revolt, want to take over the train, but they find their way blocked by Minister Mason. And this scene takes place on the 18th anniversary of the train, Snowpiercer. That old story. <laughs> Perhaps you could also give us the, the very background to the story. I mean, you did not dream up this train going around the world. That comes from a graphic novel. It does. A graphic novel was written in the 1980s, had a little bit of a cult following. And the director, who is an amazing Korean director, some of you, I hope all of you, are familiar with, is director Bong Joon-ho. Found it in a comic book store in Seoul, Korea, and read it while standing there, decided that was going to be his next film. Mm. And I was the lucky guy who got the phone call Pretty much out of the blue, I didn't know director Bong, called me and asked if, uh, if I would write the screenplay with him. And, uh, and of course, I jumped at that, that opportunity. So we were given this world of the train, uh, but we got to play in that sandbox and create that world. Yeah. Are we ready with that clip? OK. Um, obviously, these are two wildly different movies. I think you've already got a sense of that. Um, not only are they different from each other, but they're also pretty different from what we expect to, to find in the mainstream in multiplexes. Um, I think they can both be seen as genre films. Uh, I guess there's a kind of crusading biopic genre of a, kind, of a sort. Uh, and yours, action movie, comic book adaptation, we see a lot of those. But they're definitely pushing the envelope. They're pushing the envelope in terms of what we can expect to, in terms of politics, uh, the sub political subtexts are both kind of subversive. Um, the Snowpiercer, in particular, has this fantastical premise, which is uh, a much more international kind of global take than we see from Hollywood on the whole. And Dallas Buyers Club, in its different way, uh, is tackling stuff that Hollywood, I imagine, finds kind of tough to touch. Uh, HIV epidemic, homophobia, and the critique of, of the medical and government establishment. So uh, I think in, those, in that sense, there are similarities in the films, in that they're both playing outside the box, and they're both being pushing against uh, the establishment. Looks like that clip's ready to go. I love the, I love the 74%. <laughs> yes. Yes. So cool. Precisely. Precisely. <laughs> So let's, before we talk about anything else, let's go back to failure and let's, let's talk about where you guys were before you became overnight successes. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's talk about failure. <laughs> My favorite subject. I mean, it, Craig, it took you a long time to get this made, right? Sure. How long? 20 years. 20 years. That's a lot of failure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But tell me, uh, well, what was it? Was it your first screenplay? It was the first screenplay I ever wrote. It was the first screenplay I sold. I had no idea it would be the bane of my existence. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it would take longer than what we have for me to take you through the 20 years. But for sure. if, you, if there's something you want me to highlight, I can. Well, how about it's inspiration? You know, the inspir well, I was inspired by this story. Uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine sent me an article from The Independent that was called Staying Alive. And uh, I was fresh out of college, and uh, she just was like, I think this would be a cool play. And I thought, oh, I think this would be a great film. And it was 1992. And um, uh, it spoke to me on many different levels. A, because, um, well, everything I had learned about AIDS in the media was not represented in this article and these underground buyers clubs, it, I thought it was fascinating. Also, I thought Ron Woodruff was fascinating. He was such a great, perfect anti-hero. And then on top of all that, there was a personal connection to the story. My father uh, had passed away from cancer, so he had a terminal illness, 
and a lot of my experiences with the medical industry, the doctors, the pharmaceutical industry, finding alternative medications for my dad to try, you know, that, didn't, that the hospitals didn't have protocol to use here in the U.S. And just everything was just very similar. And just the drug industry, learning about the drug industry, you know, through my father. And then on top of all that, I went to Texas and met Ron Woodruff. And, you know, uh, he wasn't a man that was dying. He was a man that just started to live when he was told, you know, he had AIDS. And he was incredibly effusive, very similar to my father, and, you know, very reflective about his past, about what his hopes for the future, and, you know, really just how he was changing. And, and I, I just connected to that a lot um, in my father as well. So... That was my connection. Mm -hmm. You wrote you wrote the script then as a spec took, script. Yeah, I wrote it as a spec. It took two years. I had to do a lot of research on AIDS, the buyers clubs. I had three days of interviews with Ron Woodruff. I came back to LA and volunteered at AIDS Project LA, and I just you know I was trying to find in all the stories I write the humanity and the. Um, the core of the film, like something that everyone could relate to or at least understand. And that was this relationship. And I went down to Santa Monica Boulevard and Orange. There's a Yum Yum Donuts. <laughs> and that is a big hangout for transgendered people. Most of them heroin addicts, prostitutes. Um, and I just would sit with them and buy them coffee and donuts and talk to them. And I just thought they were just such a fascinating people, just the true outliers. And um, I thought, oh, this would be, this is the character I'm going to throw him, and this is what I'm going to throw him in with. And so how do you make that break? Oh, sorry. How right. do you make so the then, breakthrough from being one of, you know, a so mil then, million guys with a screenplay to So I happen to, I happen to, you know, I happen to be in a basketball game with a producer named Chris Moore. And in that basketball game, were a lot of people, a lot of agents, managers, lawyers, writers, actors, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon used to play in that game. And, and, and I just, Chris was a pretty big agent and he was leaving, I forget the agency is with, ICM maybe. And um, I just gave it to him to read. And then he called me and was like, I love this, I want to option it. And so that was my first, you know, sale. It wasn't a lot of money. Um, I think it was like $12,000 for 18 months. And um, I'd go to his office, and on one side of the blackboard was Dallas Buyers Club, and on the other side was Goodwill Hunting. And, um, you know, I'd be there in the mornings, and then in the afternoons, Matt and Ben would come some days. And um, their script sold like two <laughs> years later for almost a million dollars with them directing. And mine, my option ran out, and it went on to be option. So it went on to be optioned four more times and, and purchased twice, you know, six, six, and there were four sets of actors. It started out with um, Matthew McConaughey and um, Dennis Hopper directing, and I, I got an agent, I got big agents, and that was the, well, first it went to Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, and then Matthew, and we got Matthew, I mean, sorry, Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, and Woody. We got Woody and then, Woody Harrelson. And Woody Harrelson and then Dennis Hopper, and then a small company called Banner optioned it, and um, then they went bankrupt. Like a year and a half later, we developed it, and then those guys fell out, and then other producers came in, other producers, and then um, I guess I was on the fourth option, and I had met Melissa Wallach um, through a mutual friend on another project I was working on. He owned a book and. She owned the book with him. We ended up adapting that for Harrison Ford, and I just loved her writing. And then I had this other option on Dallas Buyers Club, and I just felt like at that point, I had written this small movie, and I needed another eye, and I thought she was a fantastic writer. And so she read it, loved it, came on board and said, you know, you have this great relationship movie, but I think you're missing some of the bigger picture stuff, which is the controversy behind AZT and its approval the pharmaceutical companies, the doctors, the establishment, the FDA is the most captured agency in the United States. And I said, great. And so we put all that in. 
And then um, a friend of mine who was one of my champions from the day I arrived, who read the first draft, this woman, Robbie Brenner, who worked at Miramax at the time, um, had always read the drafts along the years. And um, uh, I gave her this draft, and she said, um, I'm going to give it to my friend from NYU Film School, Mark Forster. And she did, and he read it and called her, I think, on 9 11. Because uh, I remember the day, and she's, you know, it was like 9 11. And he was walking around New York, and he's like, I have to do this film. So he came to LA, and he screened um, Monsters Ball for Melissa and I. It hadn't come out yet, but we just loved him. And uh, he said, I'm going to get Brad Pitt. And so we just loved him, you know, and um, he got Brad Pitt. And then we sold it to Universal. And um, and then we were summarily replaced, and um, and then uh, they got another writer named Guillermo Arriaga, who's a fantastic writer, but he's from Mexico and he doesn't write in English, and so he wrote his adaptation in Spanish, and they paid him a lot of money, and um, you know Brad and Mark dropped out, and then it went on from there. I think then it was. Um, Craig Gillespie and um, Ryan Gosling, and a series of other writers. And then there's a clause in the writer in the WGA that after seven years you can the rights revert back to the writers. And so Robbie called me. She said, "I'm getting that you know that script out of uh, Universal." And so she called Universal, and they were like, "Oh, you know, you can have the script back, but now there's all this money against it." And I think it was close to three million dollars. Right? So they're like, give us $3 million, you can have Dallas Buyers Club back. And so <laughs> she was like, well, guess what? She was like, I just want the original script that you purchased. I don't want to buy any of the other writer scripts. And so that was a lot of money as well. But what happened was uh, we got Matthew McConaughey and we got Jean-Marc Vallée and Matthew you know, had some weight and his agents called Universal and basically got them to release the screenplay for, you know, 25% of what we were paid against first rights to purchase it and back in and all that other stuff. And, you know, they went for it. And then, uh, you know, we had 8.8 .8 million and uh, long story short, three weeks before we started shooting, the money disappeared, you know? And uh, I had met with Matthew, I'd never met him. I went to his house and we spent what I thought was going to be lunch and ended up being like a nine hour day where we went through the script and it was like page by page, from the title page to the back page. And, you know, he asked everything. He had questions on every page and about the AIDS, doctors, Ron Woodruff, the whole thing. He was so committed, and he was re he had you know he was really skinny, and um, he was like, "We're gonna get it done," and I was like, "Okay, but just so you know, there's no money. <laughs> we don't have any money." He said, "We're shooting in three weeks. I'm gonna be in New Orleans. You know, money or no money, we're gonna get her done." And you know, I left his house just realizing of all the actors I had met along the way. You know, I'd spent a lot of time with Woody, and he was great, but. This guy was a film. At the, when I met Matthew, he was a filmmaker. You know, he wasn't just an actor. He was like he knew the film he wanted to make. He knew the character he wanted to play. He was fully invested. He had told his agents, to, you know, for that year of 2012, that he would not take any other films. You know, because a lot of times what happens is actors will attach. Everyone attaches themselves to everything, and then they fall out, and they take. Everyone's trying to get to the movie that's going to go, mm -hmm. and so they're constantly falling out and taking the bigger movie or the bigger money or the film that's. And Matthew wouldn't do that. You know, and so I owe a lot to him for that. He just hung in there and he just went in there and he was like, find the money or this is, you know, this is going to be embarrassment to me. Because it was already a self fulfilling prophecy. It was already in the news that he was shooting it, but yet we had no money. <laughs> so, you know, literally, literally, this is not a lie. It was like the week of the crew had been in New Orleans for um, two weeks and there was no money. And we were supposed to start shooting. It was like the Monday of the Sunday we were starting to shoot. And we had no money. And basically everyone was, the skeleton crew was down there. I was working with Jean-Marc on Skype. And, you know, it was like, we're, this isn't going to happen. And just on the Friday before the Sunday, 
you know, Matthew's agents just pulled a move with the two financers, which was basically a bluff, but it was basically like, if the money is not, it was a Thursday, they're like, if the money's not in the bank by Friday noon, we have this person who's gonna put the money, yeah. you guys are gonna lose the film and you'll be persona non grata forever. And Friday at noon, they deposited some of the money and I was booked on a flight and went to New Orleans for uh, you know nine weeks. That's the short version. That's amazing, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so. so Kelly, your film just kind of fell into place. Yeah, that's all well done. <laughs> Everything I've written has been perfect. Every movie has ever been, they've all been made, they've all been great, I've never, no, no problems at all. <laughs> No, my uh, my experience on Snowpiercer was. Uh... Let's talk about before before the devil knows you dead right. first, yeah, because tell you that. that that was, you know, that was your first produced screenplay. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, you were a playwright, but I know that that script also took a while to get made, right? That one took nine years. It's not a race. <laughs> <laughs> I moved to New York um, to be uh, a playwright, and I, I was a, a a very unsuccessful playwright for about twenty years. Um, began writing screenplays, and the first screenplay I wrote was Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, uh, which similarly went through some very rocky yeah. times with different producers and different directors. Um, and then, uh, really, a fucking bolt of lightning hit me. Uh, the hand of Sidney Lumet came out of the heavens and pointed to my script and said, that's the next one I want to direct. I was 49 years old by the time I had my overnight success. Um, I'd never made enough money to, uh, to, to work as a writer for a living. I worked at a bank for 20 years in New York. We'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and, and write for two hours every day because I was dedicated. And, uh, and then this, this bolt of lightning hit me and uh, Sidney Lumet directed it and it, was, it starred Philip Seymour Hoffman and Ethan Hawke and it changed my life. Um, the day the money hit the bank, I quit my job at the bank <laughs> and I've been writing ever since. Um, that's my story. Yeah. So I, I guess among the fans of that film, and there are many, was Bong Joon-ho. Yes. Was what? Like, Bong Joon-ho was a, oh, a right. fan of that movie. And, uh, and so the, when he began working on Snowpiercer, he wanted me. And I, to this day, I'm not real sure why. Um, I think perhaps because I write very dark, desperate characters that are the characters in Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, and he thought that uh, that, that would be something useful. Yeah, dark and depressing, that's useful. Um, <laughs> let's get that guy. And, uh, and so he called me. Yeah. So this seems like, you know, it's a very unusual uh, collaboration. He's Korean, he's in Korea. Uh, you're adapting a, a French mm -hmm. uh, graphic novel. Um, how much direction did he give you in the first place? Did he just give you the graphic novel and say, take it from there, or, or had he started developing it himself? He had, he had an awful lot of ideas. Uh, he did give me the graphic novel, and I have to tell you, uh, although the graphic novel is what it is, we didn't really use it. Um, we used this wonderful premise, but Bong had a different idea of what he wanted to do, um, and a different direction, and so we met in LA, uh, in Beverly Hills, at a very nice restaurant, and played with our food. Um, literally, there's a, a scene in the movie where, where Curtis, played by Chris Evans, uh, plays with protein blocks. And that's what we were doing in a restaurant in Beverly Hills, was playing with potatoes to build the train in front of us so that we could figure out you know, what went where. Um, we spent three days together just talking, uh, and then he sent me off to do a draft. He was in Seoul, Korea. I was in New Jersey at the time. Uh, a 13 hour time difference. We Skyped every Monday morning um, and we would just go back and forth and we wrote it fast. Uh, I, I'm gonna blow your mind in a second. We wrote it in 12 weeks and he pretty much shot it, which is exactly what we wrote. I never spoke to anyone else on Snowpiercer. No, no notes from anybody, no producer, no stars, no nothing. Nobody ever touched <laughs> me except director Bong Joon-ho, which is the way I wanna work forever. Wow. Just, just one person, <laughs> that's the way, I wanna, yeah. the way I wanna do it. That's cool. Very amazing. You should move to Seoul. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your collaboration uh, with uh, Dallas Buyers Club. I mean, it's kind of I'm surprised that you would approach another writer and, and ask her to, to join. Is that unusual? Yeah, it was unusual. We were, um, 
I was at a point where I was 12 years into Dallas Buyers Club, and although it had been optioned four times and the fourth option was a nice amount of money, I was frustrated, you know, and I, I, one of the things that kept coming to me was, oh, it's, you know, Craig, this is a extremely powerful anti-hero, but it's a very small story, and if you could broaden it and make it a little bigger, you might get like a studio interested. And so, you know, when Melissa came back to me with these fantastic notes, I thought, oh, that's really going to open it up. And we, we adapted a book. And, um, you know, I just thought she was a great, I mean, in, in my own humble admission, she was just such a great writer. And I just thought she could help elevate the screenplay. And so, and I really wanted to get it made. And, and, the, and the truth is, the way that she elevated it with these bigger storylines was what attracted the studios. You know what I mean? It just became like an Aaron Brockovich, if you, so to speak. The, the irony is that when we got back to someone like Jean-Marc, he really wanted to bring it back into a smaller film. You know, similar to what, you, well, which is what you saw, it became just a, a smaller film. And I learned so much in that process because you know, Jean-Marc was like, I really want to, I really want to stay in uh, Ron Woodrow's POV as much as possible. And I really want to streamline it to its most authentic moments. You know, I don't want there to be a false beat. I'm going to shoot it with, you know, no, all natural light, handheld, and I'm going to cast real people. I don't want anyone to, th I want people to feel like they're dropping into a world, you know, which I think he, he, he accomplished, and um, so we distilled it, because what happened was we didn't have a studio anymore, and so we could really make the film we wanted to make, and also Matthew did not want to make that studio type of film. He really wanted to make a character study, and so we were able to go back and really um, distill it into this small relationship movie, because that was the other thing. Um, during the... Uh, the editing process after we shot the film, I was uh, talking to James Seamus, and James said, you know, Craig, um, AIDS is really interesting, and the AZT controversy is fascinating in the drug approval process. He said, but really what people are going to connect to is this relationship. You know, that's, that's where you'll get people, and that's, because we, we needed to cut out, like, I don't know, eight or nine minutes of the film, and we were all having a hard time. Oh, should we? and ultimately that's what went. You know, we, we paid a lot of money for stock footage. And yeah. So that was the collaborative process. It was great. I mean, Jean-Marc is a uh, very generous person and um, I learned a lot from him. And, you know, he doesn't believe in dotting your I's and crossing your T's. You know, I would say, well, wait, how are people going to know that? How are they going to understand that? He's like, who gives a shit? You know, he's like, it doesn't matter. You know, how does Eve know Rayon? He's like, who cares? They know each other. You know, and then I wrote this scene on set that was basically just him saying, is that so-and-so from high school? You know, and then we just, that's all we get. That they might have gone to high school together. But you see that it didn't really matter. In studios, everything is a question. You know, there's, they just question everything. How are people going to, you know, like, oh, I don't know how people are going to watch the movie. You know, and they're going to, to make deductions on their own, and they don't have to be the deductions that we present. They can, like, people are smart. This is a smart movie. Let them make their own deductions. And that's how we went into it. We're going to collaborate with Jean-Marc on another film. It looks like Janis Joplin with Amy Adams. And we're approaching it the same way, you know, just like a very loose narrative, nonlinear character study. And we're not going to answer all the questions, you know? Yeah, nice. Um, I think it's time for another clip. Uh, I'd like to show a clip from Snowpiercer and really pursue this idea of, of clearly getting, in your case anyway, getting the, the hero and attracting a lead actor made all the difference to getting Dallas Buyers Club made. Absolutely. Um, so I'd really like to talk about shaping those hero roles. Uh, because it's really interesting in Snowpiercer 2. It's very unusual, the, the kind of nature of the hero in that film. So we have a short clip from Snowpiercer first. Um, I'll let it speak. For... Now, it's not unheard of to have a reluctant hero, but 
this guy, Curtis, is extremely backward in coming forward. Um, I wonder if you could talk about whether that was discussed in terms of, uh, again, just attracting an actor to play the part, whether that might be problematic. And as a kind of subsidiary to that, this is a film where collective action, it's, it's a real kind of uprising of people. Uh, so there's a real stress on collective action in this film. And that's, again, very unusual from the Hollywood model. Yes. Um, the, the first part of it was pretty easy for us because we didn't talk about actors. And I don't know that, that our challenge was similar to what Craig has had to go through. Um, uh, Director Bong has a, an enormous following in Korea, and he had the backing to do this movie, although that was, you know, was rocky as well. Um, but his movie wasn't necessarily dependent on a name, which is very unusual in, in the movie business now. Uh, so I think he was going to make this movie one way or another, no matter who we, ever, who we got. So, so as we were writing it, I don't know that we shaped it in such a way that you know, you'd have to, you know, give it, have, it has to be this wonderful speech so that you, know, you can get a Brad Pitt or, or someone who can get a movie made. Uh, so we really just concentrated on the character. But the second half of that question is much more interesting because we had a little bit of a struggle between us over who we wanted this guy to be. Um, we, I just, I'm so in love with this actor and so in love with this character. Um, this is a Kelly Masterson kind of character insofar as he is conflicted and he's dark and he has a terrible secret that he believes he's not worthy and doesn't deserve anything that comes to him in life. And he doesn't believe that he's good enough to be the leader, and he doesn't believe he's good enough to take the, the part of Gilliam played there by, by John Hurt. And so his journey really is to accepting himself. And it's ironic when his secret is revealed, when he finally confesses it, then he's finally free to be who he is supposed to be, which is the leader of this group. And he's been groomed to be the leader of this group since he was 17 years old. The day he stepped foot on this train, he was supposed to be the leader of this revolution. And Gilliam knew it, and he's so frustrated with Curtis. Why do you keep denying this? This is who you are, this is who you have to be. Um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful character, and it was wonderful to write that kind of a character. And, and I think, backwards, I think if you write an interesting character, you will get a good actor, and you don't, you know, mm -hmm. that, will, that will probably happen for you. But it was interesting to work with Bong on this, because we had different, we had different starting points as to who this guy was. Um, Bong has a very wicked sense of humor, and he thought this character was even darker than a Kelly Masterson character. <laughs> he thought that this character wanted to get to the front for revenge and to eat the heart of Wilford, who he meets. <laughs> and I thought, fuck, that's <laughs> twisted. He wants to eat the heart of his enemy. Um, so we had this sort of very interesting dialogue, probably a very cultural difference as well. <laughs> <laughs> over just how fucking dark this guy was going to be. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, I think it's a very... It's a, and we both, I think, arrived at this, this character, who I think ultimately is a very hopeful, symbolic character of, of how we all are meant to embrace who we are supposed to be. Curtis is supposed to be the leader. He's supposed to be the savior. He's supposed to be the hero. And he doesn't know it, and he fights it as long as he can until he can't any longer. And that's who that guy is. Yeah. I wonder with, with in your case, with, uh, you're dealing with a real person, a person you actually met. But I, I have read pieces that came out after the film that have suggested, well, he never wore cowboy clothes. He was actually more of an insurance salesman than a, than a rodeo guy. Um, other pieces have even said, oh, I always assumed other, uh, he was gay. Uh, so what responsibility do you feel in, in depicting a real person? And do you, at what point do you decide that the character has to have an independent life from, from the real life model? Say those last two questions one more time. Okay. <laughs> what extent is the historical accuracy your responsibility? Some, when right. you're dealing with a Got real it. person. Okay. And at what point uh, do you decide that the character in your screenplay has to live independently of that? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't feel any accurate responsibility <laughs> whatsoever. When, and I'm always writing biopics. Um, the difficult thing to translate is how you fit 
your story into three acts. And it's a very, although it can be loose at times, it's a very precise structure. And when developing a character, sometimes real life is more interesting than fiction, and sometimes fiction is more interesting than real life. And you have to um, take leaps to, to tell a really dramatic story. And uh, to speak to what you mentioned first, Tom, in, in, in to relation to Ron Woodruff, the Ron Woodruff I met was heterosexual. He may have been gay. I don't know. But what he represented to me was that he was a heterosexual male. On my 28 hours of interviews, he talks graphically about sex with women and theories about sex with women. He had a girlfriend when I met him who also had AIDS. Um, if he was gay, it's probably all the amount. My, my assumption is that if he was gay, he played straight to be more accessible, either to me making writing a film about him or to the community itself, you know, um, because he was actually a really shrewd man. Um, in his, when I met him at the Dallas Buyers Club, he had a cowboy hat. He definitely wore one day with a white Oxford shirt. He definitely had cowboy boots. Did he wear them every day? Did he go to a rodeo? I have no idea. Did he talk about the rodeo? Sure. In the film, which a lot of people don't always pick up on, the rodeo is a metaphor for life, you know, for Ron Woodruff, like portraying the character that he really wasn't. And also, can he, you know, riding the bull of life and actually finally at the end feeling like he did. That's, the, that's why the film is bookended with um, the rodeo. It's actually a metaphor. It's not really, we're not like, oh, he's this great rodeo. Right? He's a hustler. That's why he's hustling bats at the, at the rodeo. He would sell anything. That's the whole thing. Ron, he was a capitalist, and he saw a way to make money. And he, in certain ways, he was like Oscar Schindler of Schindler's List. He, you know, and for Oscar Schindler, he was like, the, he failed at every business. And the one thing he realized was missing was war. And for Ron, I think he failed at every business. I had his journal, you know, which I gave to Matthew. And you could see in his journal that the numbers he was dealing with was like 27, 23. Or this guy owes me $78, you know what I mean? And so he didn't really become a successful businessman until the AIDS war, if you want to call it that. And so... We had to we had to take liberties, and um, you know, Rayon is a is, is is a character. He's a created. He's not real, and so. Um, but I think he's the heart of the film, and without him, it might not be the same film. Actually, I know it would not have been the same film. So you know, similarly, uh, I'm writing the John D. Rockefeller story, and you know, running into those things as well. You know, the producers was like. Oh, but that didn't happen. And I'm like, oh, but who gives a shit? <laughs> and they're like, well, the historians will. And I was like, who cares about the historians? Are, we, are the historians going to fill the fucking movie theater? No. They're just going to sack me, you know, and sack the performance. And, and that'll be that. Like, who cares? Like, we have to make a dramatic film that people want to understand. How does one person become the richest man in the world? The first billionaire. You know, that's the story we're telling. And if, we're taking liberties of certain events, and we're taking liberties of certain events, and I don't know, you know. And and if you look at the history of films on true stories, not all of them take license. You know, it's the one thing people are like, oh, it's a biopic. All those things happen. Well, actually, probably fifty percent of them happen, and the fifty percent that are true are actualized in a in a different way, you know, that you see on the screen. So Kelly, you just wrote a TV movie about. John F. Kennedy, right? Yes. Right. Uh, I guess you can get away with less there. Oh, God. <laughs> I, had, uh, I had a lot of people telling me yeah. I couldn't take any license at all. I took a little, but, but no, I was, it was for National Geographic, and they didn't. Yeah. They gave a shit. I couldn't say, oh, who gives a shit? <laughs> I wish I could have. That you would have been true. Nothing pisses people off more when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was, it was a wonderful challenge. I was, uh, I was a, a great big uh, Kennedy buff and had you know, read, read everything I could put my hands on for, for decades about John F. Kennedy. So it was an enormous challenge to yeah. try to, try to uh, 
be true to the history, but also at the same time try to find the humanity in the man. Yeah. You can't write an icon. You can't write a you know plastic version of a character. You have to really get in and give them flesh and blood and emotions. And so I certainly understand it. I, uh, I you know, and one of the things that I was able to do, luckily National Geographic gave me a little bit of license, is, is you know you you write the dialogue, you put words in their mouths, you put emotions yeah. in their heads, and, and that's what makes drama. Hmm. Yeah, and the documentary has been made. That's right. That's true. So people can go see that. <laughs> the historians can go yeah. see that. Yeah. For the last, like, I'm only going to do another five minutes because I know you guys are going to be full of questions. So I'm going to give you 20 minutes for your questions. So for the last five minutes, I've got uh, some general kind of screenwriting questions that we should go through kind of quickly because, uh, you know, I put a lot of time into these. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I never write with an actor in mind. I think that's okay. a bad way to go into screenwriting, to think I'm going to write for this actor. Any film I've ever written, it's, I'm never thinking of an actor. <laughs> exactly. I'd like to talk about breakthroughs in the, in the process for these particular scripts, these two films. Breakthroughs where the film kind of started falling together for you, or, or perhaps, in your case, uh, I, fell into place again, where you feel like you really cracked something in the script, whether it's the, uh, the introduction of the character of Rayon or something along those lines, and also uh, sticking points, scenes where perhaps you got stuck, the, the scenes you had to rewrite the most. Mm -hmm. uh, um. One breakthrough was, you know, we wanted to take uh, Ron Woodruff through the Kubler-Ross, you know, six stages of death and dying, you know? I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's like anger, denial, acceptance, you know, God. Um, and, um, well, first of all, Ram was the biggest breakthrough. But then the other breakthrough within that um, there were three. The second one was, you know, we were talking to Jean-Marc, and it was like, well, we should have him pray to God, you know? And Jean-Marc's like, oh, he, I don't see him going to, I just don't see his character, you know, going to church, right? And so we were like, but maybe, like, he would pray to God at a, you know, at a bar. And then I was like, oh, maybe, maybe he would pray to God at a strip club. And we were like, yeah. And I was like, maybe he would buy God a lap dance. And he was like, <laughs> yeah. And so that was a big breakthrough because that just was like all character. Yeah. Um, and then the third breakthrough was really just when we went back to the screenplay at the beginning, you know, and um, after I had uh, met with Matthew and talk, we talked to Jean-Marc, it was basically like, don't, you know, take the gloves off. You know, do whatever you want. Like, you can go as dark as you want, make him as unlikable as you want. Because uh, Matthew and Jean-Marc had this opinion that the humanity would come through. But we didn't have to do anything. Like, it, would, like it, it was on the page, but it was the actor's job. And it was the director's job. Like, we didn't have to write those scenes. It would just come through. And so all sentimentality, you know, Jean-Marc was very aware of and he would not let the camera linger. So if you notice some of those scenes, he, he would, you know, in a studio movie, they'd probably hold those scenes for a few more frames. The Rayon, Ron Hug would probably be over music and held a few more frames. And by the way, they pushed for both those things. <laughs> and, you know, Jean-Marc held his ground. And there were other scenes that just, you just, they begged for a few more frames. Hold a few more frames and you'll, you'll get your audience. And Jean-Marc refused, you know. And that was the other, you know, music. They wanted to put music all throughout it. And Jean-Marc's like, no, I want it to be real. I want it to be intimate. I don't want to pull on anybody's heartstrings. You know, and those were just major, th that, See, a film, to me, and I, I don't know how you feel, but it really is a sum of all its parts. And in, in a good film or a great film, all those parts come together and elevate the screenplay in ways you might have imagined or could have never imagined, right? And so everything from the set design to the wardrobe, which is fantastic, to the performances, everyone brought their own little nuances, and then the direction, and then, of course, the editing. and if all those parts are working together, you get something half decent. And so that's really 
why a lot of films can start out with a great script and not be so great, or a horrible script, but they somehow fa they find them in the editing room. And so, mm -hmm. it really, this this was a sum of all its parts. Kelly, what about you? Break, um, breakthroughs. I always like the very first time you, you meet a character, especially one of your leads. It's so important, and you, I spend a lot of time sitting in front of a, a laptop, staring at it, waiting for the answer to come out of it. You know, how do you meet them? I like I like for an audience to know as much as possible from that very first moment. And sometimes I, I try to think of it as a silent movie. Don't give him any words, just what does he do? And then you can you, you can add the words later. So I think the big breakthrough for me was was knowing that, that Curtis would not sit down. And that's the very first time you meet him. Everyone else is sitting down, and he doesn't sit down. So you know immediately he's a, he's a nonconformist. But also thematically, you know, this is a guy who's going to stand up. And eventually he does. So that was a, a major breakthrough, mm -hmm. knowing that that was the moment. And I like that with kind of like all the major characters. Um, the first time we meet John Hurt's character, Gilliam, you, you, you know that he's past his prime, that there's something strong there, but it's, it's, it's fading. Uh, all of those things are, are very important to me. So those are, those are breakthroughs. Um, sticking point, I remember have, I had, uh, well, I had a few, but one in particular, Bong would say, oh, this should be funny. And I go, oh, yeah, well, this should be funny. And then you have to go and be funny. And I don't know how to be. Yeah. I can be funny in life, but it's, sometimes it's hard to be funny on, on paper. And the one he kept coming to was the schoolroom scene with Allison Pill. And he said, it needs to be um, surreal. It needs to be funny. And I didn't know what it was that, that he wanted. And, and so I said, well, what if they, eventually, when I finally got there, I was stuck for a while, but, but I, I thought, you know, the indoctrination and how we're, when we're in school, we all are taught these songs. I thought, if we had a funny song, that would be fun. And it was very, it was a lot of fun to write, but that was a sticking point for me to, to get to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's terrific. Oh, she is. Yeah. And I, I want to just put in a word for Tilda Swinton. What a performance. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can I tell a quick Tilda Swinton story? Yeah. I wrote the character of Minister Mason, uh, Director Bong and I wrote the character of Minister Mason as a man. And I didn't find out until maybe three weeks before they started shooting that he'd, he'd cast Tilda Swinton in the part. I said, well, Tilda Swinton's <laughs> not a man. <laughs> and so she completely made it her own. She didn't change any of the dialogue. We didn't even change any of the pronouns. People call her sir in the script. Um, she just came in and made that character all her own. So that's it is a testament to what an amazing talent she is, but also a testament, a great lesson as a as a writer. You think, you know, you think you know exactly what that is, and someone can just surprise you. Someone can take what you've written, the words I wrote, and create that with it. So yeah. Tilda's is quite remarkable. Yeah. Did you have any sticking points, any scenes that were really the toughest to write? The toughest scenes are the ones that we the, the toughest scenes are the ones we didn't use. Because um, that was the thing, you know. We had some. There were a few. The script is pretty much the script that they signed on to. Again, we just distilled it, distilled it to its truest moments. We rewrote a few scenes and we, you know, made great cuts. Um, there were there was a scene that was a monologue that Matthew had that Ron Woodruff had after he came back to this uh, mustard seed meeting where people were still towards the end of the film seeking. AZT and medications, and he does this whole monologue, and we just decided to, you know, and we just couldn't get it right, and it just seemed like he was Jesus on the mountaintop kind of thing, and, you know, uh, Matthew for sure didn't want to do that, and so we just montaged it. It just became a montage. It's like over Rayon using drugs and his whole storyline, we kept, Jean-Marc would cut back to that, and, and that solved it, yep. you know? Okay, I think we've got about 15 to 20 minutes, so if you could put the lights up and just raise your hand with a question. I'm sure there's people with mics to uh, let us hear. Right at the back. Uh, yeah, question for Craig. Um, how did your collaboration with Jean-Marc Ballet happen? You know, he just... Uh, uh, Robbie Brenner called one day, the producer, and she said, you know, I mean, there were rumblings of Matthew and Jean-Marc. Um, the truth is, uh, at the time, Jean-Marc didn't want Matthew. You know, he didn't see him as Ron. He just saw him as who Matthew, as a romantic comedy guy. And um, she just was like, Jean-Marc Vallée is going to direct, and I'm setting up a conference call. 
And that's basically, Melissa and I got on a conference call with him um, for about an hour. And we just had a, you know, a great discussion. And it just continued on. That was March of 2012. And then, you know, anyway, we had all this financing problems. And then basically the summer hit. And that's when we just, you know, there were a lot of Skype calls. And, uh, you know, he's... Um, English is his second language. He'd kill me if I said that. But so he would, we would repeat, you know, he would just repeat dialogue over and over and hear it out loud. Like, hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm like, all right, Jean Marc, yes, hello. You know, like he says hello. Yeah. And that's, it was painstaking, but it was fantastic because we really just, we would act out all the scenes. Have you had a chance to see his other work? Like, yeah, huge fan. I mean, I've seen all his other work. I had, um, I'd seen Crazy, I'd seen um, the Emily Blunt film. Uh, Young what? Victoria. Young Victoria, mm. and then he sent a cut of Cafe of Floor, which I think is magnificent. You know, I was so excited to work with someone like him. Yep. Uh, both of you encountered a lot of frustration along the way. Uh, both of you encountered a lot of frustration along the way. Uh, I can't like hear that. you. Yeah, you uh, um, were there moments where you felt like, okay, this is never going to happen, I should do something else, and what kept you going? I, I was doing something else, so I, I, just, kept, I just kept going. Um, but, you know, yes, uh, there, were, you know, there were times. I, uh, I was pretty sure that it wasn't going to happen, to be honest, because you know, I was pretty long along. Uh, in my life by the time it started to work for me. But you know, I, and you guys are, the writers here, you know this, if you gotta write, you gotta write. I couldn't, you know, I, I started to stop dreaming, but I kept writing. Because, you know, that's what you do. Uh, I have since heard this metaphor used where it's like surfing, where you, keep, you have to keep paddling out until you can catch the wave. And then if you, if you manage to catch one, you, you ride it. But then you have to turn around and, and paddle back out again. So even though I've had some successes, I still got to fucking paddle back out again. <laughs> and, but that's what I love. I, I'm a writer. I'm going to paddle, you know, whether, whether I'm going to catch a wave or not, I'm probably going to paddle anyway. Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think Kelly summed it up pretty well. I mean, um, it's a Scott Frank quote. I think it's something like, my eternal moon is fear and self-doubt. <laughs> I think that pretty much sums it up. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's, you're always staring at a blank page. And you have to come up with something. And that's, uh, you have to be incredibly brave to dive into that. And um, the entertainment industry is a daily siege. <laughs> so it's like. Even now, I'm like, it's definitely not going to happen. You know, it's, just, it's, just, it's such a tough business. And um, I always say that you get champions. It could be a friend. It could be an executive. It could be your agent. And they help, you know, prop you back up. Uh, and there's a little bit of blind faith. But for me, similar to Kelly, it got to a point where I was like, oh, shit, what am I going to do? You know, what else am I going to do? I'm fucked, you know? <laughs> Nothing, this is it. This is, I fucked up, you know? <laughs> My life is a disaster. And, you know, um, and you just keep going. I just, I really was like, I don't know how I'm going to start a career, right? Another career. And so, in a sense, you write yourself out of it. And every writer I know does that. You know, you're continually writing spec scripts. You're continually putting material out there. Whether it sells or not, you're trying to stay prolific just in your own ideas and um, hoping that, you know, someone gravitates towards it. Well, you know, again, I had 28 hours of Ron Rudriff, and so I had direct quotes. And so some of those quotes, we built scenes around. You know, and we created moments. And so, yeah, you know, yes. <laughs> I don't know if I answered the question. I get lost in the answer, and then I don't even know, I don't even know where I am anymore. I don't know. What, what was the question? <laughs> what? Distilling the essence of the movie. What do I think the film was about? <laughs> Living. 
for the first time? Oh, and I, 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 it never occurred to me. I, again, because I wrote it as a man, so that would certainly was no, not anything I was thinking of. I will tell you that uh, I, I adore when the tables get turned and she's the desperate one. And, That's you know, Suddenly she's the one from the back of the train who, mm -hmm. who's fighting for her life. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I don't, I, I, but I, I, I can't really speak to what you're asking. But, Hi, uh, thanks. Um, I'm just curious to hear about your process uh, when you're actually sitting down to write. Uh, when you have a premise, um, what is your outlining process like if you do outline at all? I'm going to lie. I don't outline. No, that's a lie. I do outline. Um, I don't, uh, when I was a, a playwright, I never outlined I, I, because I thought the muse would direct me. Um, but once you start writing films, uh, especially if you're writing them for money and for other people, they you know, insist that you write outlines. I, I usually write an outline um, f to please other people, to let them know what the, what the story is going to be. It's also the very worst way to tell a story. Um, we tell s our, our, craft, our craft is to use emotions and bodies and, and incidents and, and everything. But when you write an outline, you only have words on a page and beats. And that's not really what a, what a script is. So I'm not a fan of them if I can, give, if I can not use them. I try not to and try to just let, uh, let, uh, let it go where it needs to go. Mine is a uh, 10 foot by 4 foot cork board. It's huge. And um, first I start with music. Um, for Dallas Buyers Club, it was mostly Almond Brothers and Leonard Skinner. And then I pull images um, at the time from books and magazines. And now, of course, it's the internet. And I put up all the images, the imagery that I want to work with. Rodeos, cowboys, that kind of thing, you know. Um, Dallas in the, in the 80s. All these images, the music, and then it's these index cards. And the, I start with the scenes that I know I really want to be in the film, whatever they might be. Um, so, and then just, you know, by the time I get there, the entire 10-foot board is filled with images, index cards, and I'm always listening. I listen to a lot of music when I write. So it's always music, and, um, and it just, you know, the whole project just forms on the board. You have your sense of what you want, and then those index cards, I can move them around, you know, as I'm messing with the structure. So that's the outlining process. And then there's the outline for the studio, which is nothing like what I'm going to do, mm -hmm. <laughs> ever. Um, it's kind of just a fluff question, but I'm just wondering for both of you, um, is there a script that you wish you wrote, and why? Wow. <laughs> Dallas Buyers Club. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would have been an Academy Award nomination. Snowpiercer. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I guess, uh, yeah? Hi, I'm Craig. You mentioned that you write to music. I know Quentin Tarantino does as well. And if he's not able to get the rights, he'll then cut that scene out. Do you write with the music in mind of what's to end up on the screen? Or is that just part of your process? No, I definitely had ideas for what I thought should be on the screen. Um, but, you know, and I was so excited because um, Jean-Marc Vallée is a musical, he's a music director, his film's music is a big deal. And, but, you know, I sent him some stuff, we traded music all throughout the year, but ultimately at a certain point he said, Craig, I'm not using any music in the movie. And I was like, are you crazy? He's like, no, I'm definitely not using any music. He, he, he said, I'm going to use three songs. One will be Ron's theme, one will be Eve's theme, and one will be Rayon's theme, and that will be it. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. And that's, that's what he did, you know? But like for Janice, there's music that they have bought, and there's music that they may potentially buy, but the, they're so expensive. But right now, I'm just, I just work, I'm working my way through her entire, you know, she has eight records. And it's so helpful because her voice, she was a country singer, and then she became a rock singer, and her, the way her voice evolves throughout her career. And so, anyway, that helps a lot. But who knows? There's, the writers have no control over anything. So it's like, you know, <laughs> you go to a director, like, hey, you should do this. And automatically, their answer is no. It's, you know, it's their film. 
but you can try to sneak things yeah. in, right? Then you see Wild and it's wall to wall songs. Yeah, Wild's Wild. I'm like, what happened? <laughs> yeah, you, you like bro you like broke the store on this one. You know? We also our budget was like seventy two cents for music, and so. But Matthew, just a funny story. Matthew wanted this uh, this one song in the film, which we were all just like hated. You know, we just we were like, oh. God, but of course no one will tell him that song sucks, it's not going in the film. And, and so he started doing this thing where he would, he, and he was friends with the band, I, I think it was a ZZ Top song. So he's like, no, no, ZZ will give me the song or whatever. So he was humming it in the film, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and if you, uh, he wanted it to be that thing, right? And then uh, you know, the producer's like, hey, um, if he hums it, we're gonna have to buy it. So everything he's humming won't be usable. So then it was like, hey, Matthew, that's great. Let's try this take without the humming. <laughs> yeah, so. He's like, where's my song? Yeah. You've no loyalty. You got the film made for you. You just gotta be smart. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe to finish up, let's imagine you meet your 20-year-old self dreaming of writing screenplays. What do, you, what do you tell yourself? What tips would you give? I mean, mine are the same that they are today. It's just, they're, they're this very cliche, but it's just believe in yourself, believe in your original ideas and your original stories, you know, write your heart out and, you know, pray a lot. <laughs> mine are, you know, I, grow bigger balls, I think. 20-year-old <laughs> um, Kelly. Um, I, you know, I I think there's there's you need some some serious tools to get anywhere in the business. You need talent. Um, you need hard work. You need uh, perseverance because it can take an awful long time. You need big balls. You need uh, a spine. You need thick skin. I don't really have any of those. I certainly didn't when I was 20. I still really don't. We were talking before and and. Craig was saying that you know, as as you've been in the business longer, you've gotten used to uh, to some of the hurt of it, uh, the, and I don't think I ever have. Um, I'm kind of thin-skinned, and I'm not a great self-promoter. And if I could change anything about myself, I would change that. But then there's the fifth thing, and that's just blind fucking luck, because that's what I had. You know, that's kind of what what did it for me. Oh yeah, and the other thing I was gonna I would say that I, that I didn't say is, um, and it. The, this isn't really to my 20-year-old self, this is to myself today. Um, but I wouldn't be right, I would be writing films for yourself that you're gonna go out and make, that you're gonna go out and direct, that you're gonna go get your friends to help produce, that you're gonna raise money to you know, rent your camera package and go make films. I would definitely not be waiting to sell a spec. I would do that on the side, but really I would go make a movie because you can today. You know, you don't have to wait for anyone. And you can release a film today. And so many people are getting discovered by doing just that. I don't think the, the, the real the, the thing is, oh, I'm going to write a spec and sell it. You know, and you might, but they don't buy specs for as much money anymore. And you can't really guess the market. But what you can do is write a movie, go make it, and release it. And I, I'm doing that. I mean, I'm writing a movie to direct. So it's like, that, that's my best advice. That's good advice. Thank you both. Thanks again to the Harold Greenberg Fund. Thank you. Thank you.